Tyler McKay, and Cole Miner. Texas Representative Lucian Walton Parrish, Democrat, Texas. The time once was when we welcomed to our shores the oppressed and downtrodden people from all the world. But they came to us because of oppression at home and with the sincere purpose of making true and loyal American citizens. And in truth and in fact, they did adapt themselves to our ways of thinking and contributed in a substantial sense to the progress and development that our civilization has made. But that time has passed now. New and strange conditions have arisen in the countries over there. Anarchy and Bolshevism are threatening the very foundation of many of them. There can be nothing so dangerous as for us to allow the undesirable foreign element to poison our civilization and thereby threaten the safety of the institutions that our forefathers have established for us. New York Representative Albert B. Rossdale, Republican. Mr. Chairman, the gentleman from Texas has stated that two million or possibly more people will enter the United States in the coming year. The estimated steamship capacity for a year are 809,000. Now why this hysteria? The gentleman also assumes that all of these people over there are antagonistic to American ideals and interests. Has the gentleman ever come in contact with a lot of these immigrants? And does he really know that they are of this type? I come from the Bronx, where there are a great deal of these so-called foreigners, and I have an intimate knowledge of their political opinions and ideals. And I can say to the gentleman from Texas that if he had even a speaking acquaintance with them, he would quickly learn that they breathe pure and higher ideals than he had any previous knowledge of. I invite the gentleman from Texas to come to the Bronx and find out for himself what splendid American citizens they make. <laughs> Alabama Senator James Thomas Heflin, Democrat. American labor cannot compete with cheap labor of Europe. I can never understand why you would build a tariff wall between the products of cheap labor of Europe and the United States and then throw the doors to America open to thousands of cheap European laborers who come here and compete with American labor. Yes, come here and compete with the loyal American citizen who has a wife and children to support. If you want to protect these men, protect them by keeping out those who work for starvation wages and spread their dangerous doctrines around the industrial establishments of our country and take the places of our men and get money that ought to be going into the pockets of the loyal wage earners of America. New York Representative Frederick W. Rowe, Republican. The fact is that in this country, we need laboring men and women of certain classes. We are now paying in the city of New York for ordinary shovelers to dig ditches in which to lay sewer or water pipe from $4.50 to $6 a day. We are paying $6 to $9 a day for hod carriers. It is not because we have plenty of men in this country. The fact is, our people of a second generation in this country will not carry a hog or dig a trench. Illinois Representative Adolph J. Sabbath, Democrat. Mr. Chairman, the charges that are being made against the present day immigration are by gentlemen who come from sections who receive no immigration and who are not in a position to know as much about that question as those who come from and live in the cities and the states that absorb most of the present day immigration. Is it not singular that up to the moment, not a single gentleman coming from our great cities or our great states who I am sure are better acquainted with the immigration question than those from the rural districts has said a word on behalf of this legislation. But on the contrary, like myself, feel it is hasty, uncalled for, unnecessary, and unjustified. Our very existence is threatened. American institutions are threatened by this influx of the refuse and criminal hordes of foreign countries. In the name of the boys who fought and died in France, I protest against such a course. I plead for the preservation of the institutions of my country. I plead for the great army of wage earners of America 
and to protect and defend them against this horde of unfit foreigners who want to come here and take their places in our industrial establishments. I plead for the honor and glory of my flag and for the preservation and perpetuity of American institutions. New York Representative Meyer London, socialist, we sent two million abroad to make the world safe for democracy, to liberate these very people. Now you shut the door to them? Yes, so far we have made the world safe for hypocrisy. To prevent immigration means to cripple the United States. Our most developed industrial states are those which have the largest immigration. Our most backward states industrially and in the point of literacy are those which have no <laughs> immigration to speak of. Defenders of this bill thoughtlessly repeat the exploded theory that there have been two periods of immigration. The good period, which the chairman of the committee fixes up to be the year 1900, and the bad period since. The strange thing about it is that at no time in history has any country made such rapid progress in industry, in science, in the sphere of local legislation as the country has shown since. 1900. The new immigration is neither different nor worse. And besides that, identically the same arguments were used against the old immigration. Thank you. Wow, the Emergency Quota Act was only a temporary policy. It established quotas by national origin as the structure of our immigration laws. It capped immigration at 3% of a nation's population in the US as of the census of 1910. That is, annual immigration to the United States from any country could not exceed 3% of that nationality's officially established US population, according to the 1910 census which makes a lot of sense if you don't think about it very much. <laughs> the 1910 census heavily favored Northern Europeans over Eastern and Southern Europeans. I'm glad you're all sitting down. But when Congress voted in 1924 to make the quota system permanent, they decided that maybe it didn't favor Northern Europeans enough. So they didn't base the new quotas on the most recent census of 1920, nor the numbers that were already in use for the 1910 census. census. Instead, they based the new permanent quotas on the census of 1890, referred to by some as the Anglo-Saxon census. <laughs> the quota system was still in place when World War II created millions of refugees, displaced persons, and people who were no longer the citizens of any country. In defiance of U.S. public opinion, President Truman pushed Congress to do something about that situation. He was not happy with the results. President Harry Truman's statement by the President upon signing the Displaced Persons Act, delivered on June 25, 1948, read by Zoe Benson. It is with very great reluctance that I have signed S. 2242, the Displaced Persons Act of 1948. If Congress were still in session, I would return this bill without my approval and urge that a fairer, more humane bill be passed. In its present form, this bill is flagrantly discriminatory. It mocks the American tradition of fair play. Unfortunately, it was not passed until the last day of the session. If I refused to sign this bill now, there would be no legislation on behalf of displaced persons until the next session of Congress. It is a close question whether this bill is better or worse than no bill at all. Americans of all religious faiths and political beliefs will find it hard to understand, as I do, why the 80th Congress delayed action on this subject until the end of this session, with the result that most attempts to improve the bill were frustrated. The bill which it finally reported, without a single public hearing, was roundly and deservedly criticized by all who were interested in achieving a fair solution of this problem. I have analyzed closely the bill which was sent to me for signature. Its good points can be stated all too briefly. At long last, the principle is recognized that displaced persons should be admitted to the United States. <laughs> But the bill discriminates in callous fashion against displaced persons, 
of the Jewish faith. This brutal fact cannot be obscured by the maze of technicalities in the bill or by the protestations of some of its sponsors. The primary device used to discriminate is the provision restricting eligibility to those displaced persons who entered Germany, Austria, or Italy on or before December 22, 1945. Most of the Jewish displaced persons who had entered Germany, Austria, or Italy by that time have already left. And most of the Jewish persons now in those areas arrive there after the December dateline and hence are denied a chance to come to the United States. By this device, more than 90% of the remaining Jewish displaced persons are definitely excluded. Even the eligible 10% are beset by numerous additional restrictions written into the bill. This bill also excludes many displaced persons of the Catholic faith who deserve admission. These two are barred by the December dateline. It is inexplicable except upon the abhorrent ground of intolerance that this state should have been chosen. The Jewish and Catholic displaced persons who are wrongly excluded by this bill fled their native countries for the same basic reasons as Balts who came before December 22, 1945, and Czechs who came after January 1948, who are rightly included. I sincerely hope that Congress will remedy this gross discrimination at its earliest opportunity. The bill reflects a singular lack of confidence by the Congress in the capacity and willingness of the people of the United States to extend a welcoming hand to prospective immigrants. It contains many restrictive requirements, such as prior assurance of suitable employment and safe and sanitary housing, unnecessarily complicated investigation of each applicant, and burdensome reports from individual immigrants. I regret that the Congress saw fit to impose such niggardly conditions. I know what a bitter disappointment this bill is to the many displaced victims of persecution who look to the United States for hope, to the millions of our citizens who wanted to help them in the finest American spirit, to the many members of Congress who fought hard but unsuccessfully for a decent displaced persons bill. I hope that this bitter disappointment will not turn to despair. I have signed this bill in spite of its many defects in order not to delay further the beginning of a resettlement program and in the expectation that the necessary remedial action will follow when the Congress reconvenes. Congress did not listen to anything Truman said. <laughs> anything. It was all right. So Truman directed the State Department to prioritize refugees over other immigrants and to exploit a loophole in the legislation allowing officials to mortgage quotas from future years. To cite the most extreme example, Latvia technically used up all of its quota slots through the year 2274, <laughs> though the quota system would be discarded well before that in 1965, which is lucky for us because, of course, Latvia controls the asteroid belt in 2274, and we do not want to be on their bad side. <laughs> We have a long history in this country of working loopholes into even the most restrictive immigration laws. In most cases, though, this legal maneuvering is not to designed to protect immigrants, but rather to protect the companies that employ them. Of course, the U.S. government has long since stopped prioritizing companies over individuals, and thank heaven that's it. <laughs> in 1952, Congress made it illegal to harbor undocumented immigrants, but specified that employment did not qualify as harboring. In 1986, Congress created sanctions on employers using undocumented labor, but only if they knowingly used undocumented labor. And even then, it was illegal for the Immigration and Naturalization Service to inspect, in the law's terms, outdoor agricultural operations without a warrant. Agricultural workers in particular have long been subject to exploitation. In the 1960s, <laughs> Mexican-American civil rights activist Cesar Chavez decided to do something about it. Along with Dolores Huerta, he set out to unionize Latino farm workers. In 1965, Chavez and Huerta's National Farm Workers Association joined forces with Filipino workers and launched a nationwide grape boycott that lasted more than five years, but ultimately led to victory. This is not the only time that a grape boycott has had a significant effect on American politics. Yes, it is. <laughs> Chavez went on, went on to become an iconic figure in the labor movement. He delivered the following speech in San Francisco on November 9th, 1984, read now by Javier Morillo.
21 years ago, last September, on a lonely stretch of railroad track paralleling US Highway 101 near Salinas, 32 Bracero farm workers lost their lives in a tragic accident. The Braceros had been imported from Mexico to work on California's farms. <coughs> they died when their bus, which was converted from a flatbed truck, drove in front of a freight train. Conversion of the bus had not been approved by any government agency. Most of the bodies lay unidentified for days. No one, including the grower who employed the workers, even knew their names. Today, thousands of workers live under savage conditions, beneath trees and amid garbage and human excrement, near tomato fields in San Diego County. Tomato fields, which use the most modern farm technology. Vicious rats gnaw on them as they sleep. They walk miles to buy food at inflated prices, and they carry in water from irrigation pumps. Child labor is still common in many farm areas. Farm workers are not agricultural implements. They are not beasts of burden to be used and discarded. I am not very different from anyone else who has ever tried to accomplish something with his life. My motivation comes from my personal life, from watching my mother and father, what they went through when I was growing up, from what we experienced as migrant farm workers in California. That dream, that vision, from my own experience with racism, with hope, with the desire to be treated fairly and to see my people treated as human beings and not as chattel. It grew from anger and rage, emotions I felt 40 years ago when people of my color de were denied the right to see a movie or eat at a restaurant in many parts of California. It grew from the frustration and humiliation I felt as a boy who couldn't understand how the growers could abuse and exploit farm workers when there were so many of us and so few of them. I began to realize what other minority people had discovered that the only answer, the only hope, was in organizing. More of us had to become citizens. We had to register to vote. And people like me had to develop the skills it would take to organize, to educate, to help empower the Chicano people. We experienced some successes in voter registration, in politics, in battling racial discrimination. But deep in my heart, I knew I could never be happy unless I tried organizing the farm workers. I didn't know if I would succeed, but I had to try. All Hispanics, urban and rural, young and old, are connected to the farm workers' experience. We had all lived through the fields where our parents had. We shared that common humiliation. How could we progress as a people, even if we lived in the cities, while the farm workers, men and women of our color, were condemned to a life without pride? How could we progress as a people while the farm workers, who symbolize our history in this land, were denied self-respect? How could our people believe that their children could become lawyers and doctors and judges and business people while this shame, this injustice, was permitted to continue? The Union survival, its very existence, sent out a signal to all Hispanics that we were fighting for our dignity, that we were challenging and overcoming injustice, that we were empowering the least educated among us, the poorest among us. The message was clear. If it could happen in the fields, it could happen anywhere, in the cities, in the courts, in the city councils, in the state legislatures. From time to time, you will hear our opponents declare that the union is weak, that the union has no support, that the union has not grown fast enough. Our obituary has been written many times. How ironic is it that the same forces which argue so passionately that the union is not influential are the same forces that continue to fight us so hard. The union's power in agriculture has nothing to do with the number of farm workers under union contract. The very fact of our existence forces an entire industry, unionized and non-unionized, to spend millions of dollars year after year on improved wages, on improved working conditions, on benefits for workers. 
If we are so weak and unsuccessful, why do the growers continue to fight us with such passion? Because so long as we continue to exist, farm workers will benefit from our existence, even if they don't work under a union contract. And Hispanics across California and the nation who don't work in agriculture are better off today because of what the farm workers taught people about organization, about pride and strength, about seizing control over their own lives. Like other immigrant groups, the day will come when we win the economic and political rewards which are in keeping with our numbers in society. The day will come when politicians do the right thing by our people out of political necessity and not out of charity or idealism. That day may not come this year. That day may not come during this decade, but it will come. Cesar Chavez remained active in the labor movement up until his death in 1993. Our next reading is from a Haitian-American writer, Edwige Dantecott, a masterful, critically acclaimed novelist, essayist, and short story writer. She has won numerous awards, including a MacArthur Genius Fellowship, which is very different from the MacArthur Ignoramus Fellowship, <laughs> and has been awarded honorary degrees from Smith and Yale. But this piece of writing is not an excerpt from a novel or short story. It is part of Don Tocott's testimony before the House Judiciary Committee's Subcommittee on Immigration, Citizenship, Refugees, Border Security, and International Law. It is read by Suzanne Cross. Madam Chairwoman and members of the committee and subcommittee, I thank you very much for the opportunity to submit, for the record, this testimony concerning immigration detainees and medical care. I write you today not in my own name, but in the name instead of a loved one who died while in custody of the Department of Homeland Security and Immigration and Customs Enforcement officials at Chrome Detention Center in Miami. His name was Joseph Nozius Danica, and he was 81 years old. He was the patriarch, the head of our family. He was a father of two, a grandfather of 15, an uncle of nearly two dozen of us, a brother, a friend, and even after surviving throat cancer, which took away his voice, a minister in a small flock in Port of Prince Haiti. He had been living in the same impoverished neighborhood in Haiti for more than 15 years, when on October 24, 2004, United Nations troops and Haitian police forces launched a military operation there. Their goal was to oust armed neighborhood gangs. However, during the clash followed, they used the roof of his church to fire at and kill more than a dozen of his neighbors. After these forces left the neighborhood, because the shots had been fired from his roof, gang members came to my uncle's home and threatened to kill him. When he was able to flee and eventually travel to the United States, where he has been a frequent visitor for more than 30 years, he had with him a passport and a valid multiple entry visa, which he would have expired in 2008. However, because he requested what he termed temporary asylum, he was immediately arrested and taken to Chrome Detention Center in Miami, where the medications he was taking for high blood pressure and an inflamed prostate were taken away from him. He made this known as much as he could to his son, to his lawyer, and to me on the phone and to the medical staff at Chrome, where he was held in the short stay medical unit. However, his pleas were ignored by those who had taken the medications away. On the morning of his credible fear hearing, my uncle became ill as a result of this. To those who saw him, including his lawyer, he appeared to be having a seizure and he began to vomit. Vomit shot out of his mouth, his nose, as well as the tracheotomy hole he had in his neck as a result of a throat cancer operation. The vomit was spread all over his face, 
from his forehead to his chin, down to the front of his dark blue chrome-issued overall. According to the report prepared by the officer and inspector general of the Department of Homeland Security, 15 minutes passed before help arrived. When the medic and nurse arrived at the scene, the medic accused my uncle of faking his illness. To prove his point, the medic grabbed my uncle's head and moved it up and down. It was rigid uh, rather than limp. He said, besides, my uncle would open his eyes now and then and seem to look at him. You can't fake vomit. My uncle's lawyer, John Pratt, shot back. This man is very sick, and his medication shouldn't have been taken away from him. The medications were indeed taken away from him, replied the medic, in accordance with the facility's regulations and substituted with others. Later that morning, my uncle's condition worsened, and with manacles on his ankles, he was transported to Miami Jackson Memorial Hospital. My uncle's medical records from Chrome and from Jackson Memorial Medical Hospital indicated that he arrived at the emergency room at Jackson Memorial Hospital around 1 p.m. with the intravenous strip in progress from Chrome. He was evaluated by a nurse practitioner at 1.10 p.m. At 4 p.m., during a more thorough evaluation by the nurse practitioner, he complained of acute abdominal pain, nausea, and loss of appetite. At 5 p.m., he was transferred to a hospital prison area, Ward D. The records indicate that he was seen for the first time by a physician at 1 p.m. the next day, exactly 24 hours after he'd been brought to the emergency room. At 7 p.m., after more than 20 hours of no food and sugarless IV fluids, my uncle was sweating profusely and complained of weakness. He was found to be hypoglycemic with a lower than normal sugar level of 42 milligrams per deciliter. 